welcome to the nonprofit show. We are so glad you're here for a Monday as we start off this week extremely strong with Alex Lapa. Extremely excited to have him. He is the CEO at Dryad Consulting joining us on the nonprofit show today. He's here to talk to us about something that we often talk about, um, but he's going to tell us how to use it right. So are you using tech or technology right? So Alex is here to talk to us about that. And before we jump deep into that technology conversation, we want to remind all of you, our loyal viewers and listeners, who we are. Uh, so hello to Julia. Julia Patrick is here. CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. Honored to be alongside Julia each and every day for these nonprofit uh, show episodes. You know, we've been going strong now, coming up on four years, over 750 episodes. And we have to say thank you, thank you to thank you to our amazing presenting sponsors that allow us this platform and the opportunity to talk to the great minds like Alex today. So a shout out to our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy at National University, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Your Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, as well as the Nonprofit Nerd. Do yourself a favor, do us a favor, do all of our sponsors a favor, check them out. They're here for you. I really like to say their mission is your mission. So they're here to lean into your mission and help you do more good in, around, and throughout your community. Hey, if you missed any of our episodes, that's okay. You can find us on Roku, YouTube, Amazon Fire TV, Vimeo, as well as podcasts. So go ahead and queue us up wherever you stream your entertainment. Um, in just a few hours after our conversation with our guest today, it will be live on many of these streaming, all of these streaming platforms. So without further ado, Alex, I want to introduce you. Alexander goes by Alex. Lapa has joined us here today. Again, he is the CEO at Dryad Consulting. We are so glad to help you have you. So officially, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Okay, Alex, we, we called you out on your beautiful, I would like to call it Northern accent. Mm -hmm. Where are you coming to us from, from today? Normally, I'm in Montreal in Canada, but actually today I'm in Spain. So I'm a digital nomad where I spend yeah. half this time, half the year in Montreal, the summer season. And then winter seasons, which are really awful in Montreal, I head over <laughs> to the south of Spain. Holy cow, you're like my dream person. What part of southern Spain are you coming to us from? It's a small town near Malaga. So wonderful temperatures, 65 to 70 degrees in January and February. Wow. Okay, now we're really going to believe what you have to say <laughs> because you're coming to, to us from this like totally amazing place. Well, talk to us about what Dryad Consulting does before we get into peppering you with more questions. Sure. So Dryad Consulting was formed about 20 years ago, and we basically do Salesforce consulting. So Salesforce projects for nonprofits. Okay. Um, yeah, that's basically the, the core message. And then we have a bunch of apps and other, uh, other types of um, promotion items as well. Great. And you had shared with us, you have... Um, you have the app, you do a lot of Salesforce training and kind of forums, you have your own podcast. So where do we find your podcast? The podcast is called Agents of Nonprofit and I'm basically interviewing people in the nonprofit space, helping nonprofits using technology. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Awesome. awesome. Well, that's a huge thing. And Jarrett and I have been talking about this and I can't wait to get to this conversation with you is that we feel like um, so much technology was kind of for nonprofits put on the back burner, but then with the COVID pandemic, it just really forced the nonprofit sector to embrace and move forward. I mean, in the beginning of the nonprofit show, Jared, isn't this true? We spent a lot of time talking about how to get your staff on Zoom meetings and Absolutely. how to behave on Zoom. I mean, hello. the very basics, the very basics, you know, even like, connecting to technology from their home, um, computers. I mean, really the basics. And here we are, you know, again, almost four years later. So a lot has changed. There was a very popular comic a few years ago, just after COVID started, that said, you know, indicate which of the four following factors was the biggest driver toward technology, CEO, CTO, and then COVID. And all the answers were COVID. Oh. It really pushed the frontier forward in terms of technology. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I believe that. And I've got to believe that you have spent a lot of time and talk to us about that before we, we go any further. Have you found yourself spending a lot of time just talking about the implementation of technology versus the actual technology, almost like in a cultural sense? Yeah, the, the key for any technology is making sure it's the right tool for the job, making sure it's the right technology, because you have so many choices out there. How do you know which is the right one for you for your particular task? And that's like the first conversation to be had. And then it's, it's you know, narrowing down the categories of, okay, now we need this kind of software to do this. Where, what are our choices? Where do we go for, for advice? Uh, and how do we filter it down to the one or two choices before making that final assessment? Amazing. Well, let's delve into that because one of the first points that you have uh, that kind of amplifies that sensibility is understanding when to use technology and drama when not to use technology. What do you mean by that? So technology is a tool, right? And any other tool, you need to know when to use it and when not to use it. It's just like you have when you have, when you have a hammer, you're supposed to hammer nails in, but you wouldn't want to use a hammer to do, to do screw driving. Sure. to do to work in screws so it's making sure that whatever you're trying to do you have the right tool for the right job um and it, a tool is supposed to be about automation as well right it's supposed to automate these tasks that are more structured so that you can focus on the things that you really add value to as opposed to things that just can be done really quickly yeah. so the whole concept is use the tool when it works in that favor and then don't use it when if it doesn't work in that favor mm -hmm. and i feel like there's there's so many tools, you know, when it comes to technology, and we think of, of nonprofits around the globe, Alex, and some organ some departments within an organization use one tool, another department uses another tool. Sometimes they intersect, sometimes they don't. Um, so I'm really curious if you can talk to us again, just you know, off the cuff. What does that look like? And and what are you seeing when it comes to, you know, um, organization systemization and, and integration? I've noticed that for smaller nonprofits, the team, people and teams be, are very separated, right? Each one has their own preference. Some might be paper, some might be Excel. One team might have a CRM, might have a donor management system. And most likely they are very separate because they're choosing it within their own capacities and capabilities. And they don't really wanna have too much inter-team communication. At least it, that's not a requirement at the beginning. Right. But then as nonprofits become more and more advanced, that's when the cohesion and the communication inter teams make a big difference because you become more effective at what you do. So that's the point where you start evaluating as a team, as a full unit, when does it make sense to, to approach what tool and which tool to use? That would be the starting point. It's so interesting because um, it seems to me that these tools that we use are so specific for our silos. And when we look at programming versus development, you know, wow, what a hard thing to try and even communicate, I think, what the jobs are. Because I think a lot of times, and Jared, I'd love to get your feedback on this, development has this whole ecosystem and concept of what they think programming does. And programming has a whole ecosystem and thought process about what they think the slackers in development are doing. Like they're just going out to lunch and having a good time. Right. Right. Getting, getting paid to have coffee. Yeah. Yeah. I exactly. think there's a lot of misconception, but Alex, you hit the nail on the head. And, and I really do think that, you know, the smaller the organization, the, the greater the silos. And I really think it comes to the team, the executive team, really all players, you know, to, to really create that cohesiveness because you're right. Like coming together in technology, having this system overlap, that's when you see success. And I, I always, I love a good executive dashboard. You know, like show me a good dashboard that that will make my day. <laughs> and it's, there's nothing wrong, by the way, having a, a disjointed system at the beginning, right? You want to focus on the non on the mission, on your users or your customers or your clients or your volunteers. The, the tool you're using at the time probably doesn't matter too too much. But it's as you get more effective, as you grow as an organization, that's when you'll start seeing a lot of cost savings and time savings and and very money savings yeah. as you become more cohesive as a as a single unit. So a part and parcel of that, you always say, or you don't, I don't know if you always say, but um, in our in our preliminary discussion, you talked about making tech work for you and not the other way around. What does that mean? 
So a big part of the, the tool and technology is making sure that the user experience is works for you. And user experience is something that I'm, I'm actually certified in as well as being um, with CRM in that you learn that uh, to build a system that your users are already used to using. And what I mean by that is when you go to a website, for example, you already know more or less how websites work. You know, there's a menu going to be over here. You might have that hamburger three bar menu and various other points. You know what a hyper, hyperlink looks like. You know what text looks like. Yeah. You already know these things because you've used it hundreds and hundreds of times before. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing for any kind of technology. When you're building technology, you want to make sure that you're adopting user experience principles so that you don't have to train. This is what you need to click on. This is what you need to do next. It's intuitive based on the fact that it's been done many times before. You're not building anything original. So making sure that the tech works for you is, is making sure that the choices you're making, the technologies you're choosing has a good user experience and you discard the ones that don't, the ones that don't work for you. It's wow. interesting because, you know, I think sometimes we get lured into the concept of this is new and different, exciting, and nobody has it. And I love what you just said about making something familiar so that you have greater success or uh, comfort and engagement. It's really an interesting way to look at this. There's there's a lot of cool things happening on the on the edge of frontier of, of technology, but nonprofits is some is an area I wouldn't recommend should evolve to that not to that cutting edge. They should be using systems that are a bit more established, a bit more uh, refined, and have been used and adopted by many by many users. There are some exceptions to that rule, but but generally you want to make sure that it's been t tried and tested before you actually adopt it. Yeah, I do feel that we we the nonprofit sector are often, you know, the latest to adopt innovation. And I, I really see that when it comes to technology. Now, I was at the Association of Fundraising Professionals Conference last year um, in Vegas this year. It's coming up in New Orleans. Um, but what I saw at that conference, Alex, and again, this is really fundraisers, right, is that it was a fundraising conference with technology first. Like the entire showroom, I felt, was just filled every, every row of technology, technology, technology. So there's so many things out there. I love that you said like, hey, let's not be the beta, you know, let's not be the first adopter. Let's let's have someone else kind of, you know, uh, write the ship so that it's ready for us. What are you seeing when it comes to like, I don't know, once we adopt something, has it then become obsolete? Definitely not. Um... Okay. Yeah, no. Um, and when you meant, actually, before I answer that question, there was something you mentioned, you said nonprofits are the latest to adopt technology. You mean the last well, or the most? Yes, like we're not, okay. yes, we are like, you know, the latest being. Way back. Yeah. The, the last, okay. Yeah. And that's perfectly fine. I mean, you don't want to be the very last, obviously, but the idea is you want to wait for the technology to be a year or two old before you adopt it. Something that's really, uh, you know, new uh, might not succeed. It might not be around after a long period of time. You want to, like I said, make sure that it's been tried and tested before you start adopting it. There's a risk to becoming, to using that shiny new toy in that it's, it might not be around or it might be uh, not exactly what you need it to do. Well, I think a year or two is safe because that's probably the average amount of time before we even hear about it in our sector. Right. <laughs> you know, the fact that it, it's kind of been been tested. So you mentioned the shiny new toy, and that is interesting to me because I do feel that there are so many shiny new toys out there. So talk to us about that shiny new toy syndrome. Like anything else, you want to make sure that the, the tool is established to a certain degree and I mean, there might be some interesting things that you want to explore on your own personal time and might want to introduce to the organization at some point, but the need or the desire to jump to something new every single you know, day, week, month, whatever technology comes out, it, it can just be destructive. You'll just spend all your time researching things. Uh, we better, might, it would much be better to have some kind of help, um, external help, like a strategist or a researcher do this kind of work for you and then propose certain technologies to you so you don't have to spend your time and you doing all this kind of research on your own. Yeah. So going the other direction, Alex, I'm interested, I mean, and this is like such a broad question, but is there a shelf life? Like new technology really is changing, you know, every 24 months or like, should we kind of get into um, a, a pattern of understanding that we're gonna need to make shifts or even just updates? What does that look like across the trajectory? 
Yeah, there is a misconception that once you buy something or you use a technology that you can just use it forever. Yeah. And technology, unfortunately, requires a bit of energy, sustenance. You have to sustain that energy constantly. And it's something you just have to reframe or reimagine or re uh, change your perception of. And that technology just requires a certain amount of energy. Um, so my evaluate, my idea usually is to do an evaluation, is to basically audit your systems every X, let's say, six months to a year to make okay. sure that the technology you have is still working for you. And then maybe see if there's something better out there that you can use. But there's, it's not like a need where you have to do this uh, every day or you wouldn't want to do it every five years. But let's say on a six months to a 12 month period, um, just to make sure that you're, you're keeping that, that um, technology alive, you keep on feeding it and it, it's still working for you. Who's doing that assessment? Is, that, is this like the IT person? If you're fortunate enough to have one, is this each individual department? Who should be leading that charge? There probably should be one person at the organization, if you're lucky enough to have a one person that kind of drives the conversation in the various departments. Okay. Uh, if not, it's a coordinated effort. You know, if you don't have one person that can be dedicated, or like I mentioned earlier, you could have some external strategists come and help you evaluate that process. So okay. let's talk about this elephant in the room, AI, artificial intelligence, and what's that? what that is doing essentially to all of us, and this this spans beyond, obviously, the nonprofit industry, but that's a shiny new toy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I love it. It's a really cool toy. So it, it's a toy in the sense of it, it's a tool as well, right? I mean, we already use automation in our daily lives. We don't do everything manually anymore. We to, Everybody, to a certain extent, already uses some kind of automation. And this right. chat GPT, for example, as an AI example, is just another tool that we can use. And people have this fear that it's going to replace people's jobs. And the, the consensus is more, it's, it's people using chat GPT and AI in general, who will be replacing people who are not using AI. Okay. So it's basically another tool in your trade to make you better, faster, stronger, more effective, more efficient, not to complete, completely erase you or replace you. So I've used it and yeah, I think it is, yeah, it is fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a hit, sometimes it's a miss, you know, but really looking at, okay, what is this? What exactly is this? What, you know, what's the possibility of it? Um, so I'm, I'm really curious, you know, if, if this is what's come out now, imagine what's going to come out in just two more years or maybe even one year. Yeah, I would call this version 1.0. So I imagine okay. version two, version three, I mean, it's just going to get better and better. You're going to be able to use it in more situations. Um, sure. And it just, again, you'll be able to focus on the things that actually bring value to the organization as opposed to writing a proposal or explaining right. certain technologies to you or certain concepts to you. That's what this tool can be used for. Ooh, you got me a proposal. I have not written a grant with it, but I, I think okay. I'd like to try that to say, you, you know, yeah, I think I would like to try that. Yeah. At least as a starting point. At this point, uh, it's not the as version 1.0, as I call it, it might get you 80% of the way there and you'll have right. to make modifications, tweaks and whatnot, but at least it's 80%. Yeah. So that will save you a lot of time so you can focus on the parts that, you know, you can only do. Sure. You know, I love that you uh, brought this up, the, the piece of it in, in terms of the value of our own teams in that um, these tools are going to help to amplify the workload that we can take on, the work that we can do, and that ultimately, if we don't have these skills, uh, then we will be replaced by people who do, and that's the engagement of this technology. I think when you framed it that way, it makes it a lot less frightening for some people who feel like they're going to be left behind. Yeah, right. Um, and that's, that's really what it is. It's making sure they even have a name for it now. It's called prompt engineer. Someone who knows how to use this chat GPT is called a prompt engineer because uh, it's like a prompt, like a command prompt back in the old days of computing. Yeah. And the idea is that the better you are at using these kinds of tools, just like you are any other tool, if the better you are using a CRM, the better you are using a hammer, the more effective you'll be and the more in demand you're going to be. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to start looking for that uh, key phrase, you know, on resumes. I'm curious if, if that's being integrated into, into resumes and just overall, you know, talking about the workforce in general, a prompt engineer. I've not heard yeah. that. Have you, Julia? No, I haven't. But it's, um, I mean, when you do use, uh, just yeah. think about uh, chat GPT, you have those prompts, you put those things in and mm -hmm. the better you are, the the more I think the more robust the the work that gets spit out it and you're right back in the 
the old days of learning COBOL and Fortran, I'm aging, I'm dating myself, <laughs> you had to do the, you know, it was all the prompt piece work. So yeah, it makes sense. You know, it's been so interesting to talk to you and I, I want to uh, spend the, the little bit of time that we have remaining um, having you talk to us about Salesforce. And I realize that you are certified and that you work with that product, but Salesforce for nonprofits, um, it seems like it's really, I'm hearing more and more organizations use it. Um, can you kind of give us an overview of what you see going on with that technology? Yeah, I don't know where to begin with that one. Um, and I do want to <laughs> I respect that one of your- That's a big um, question. Yeah, and I want to respect that one of your um, promoters is uh, Bloomberg, which is a competitor to Salesforce. So I want to respect that as well. Bloomerang, yeah. The idea is it goes back to the, you know, writing the right tool for the right job, right? There might be some situations, and even I say, I promote that as well. Even the fact that I do work with Salesforce, I don't necessarily mean that Salesforce is the right tool for every nonprofit. There will be some okay. situations where it's not. Okay. Um, and the biggest difference I find between Salesforce and some other CRMs is that Salesforce is more of a platform. It's not just a CRM, it's, it's bigger than that. So that tends to attract the larger nonprofits, okay. the ones that really need to have this cross system, cross enterprise level of communication versus the smaller CRMs, which are very, very good at very specific tasks. They're meant generally for smaller organizations. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I've seen with Salesforce um, and happy, happy to chime in on this, Julia, is that often when there's volunteers that come from the sales world and they're very familiar yeah. with like a business yeah. development CRM, they yeah. are easily integrated into Salesforce and can often help build customized forms, things like that. Um, not to say that it's seamless, but I just feel like there's a lot more um, knowledge around that. And, and when it comes to that interchange, as opposed to a platform that's been designed specifically for nonprofits. Um, so I've seen that as definitely a positive. And I know there's so many amazing user groups out there. We have um, some here in our community, which has been a lot of fun to watch. And, um, you know, what you had shared, Alex, about making sure it's the right tool. You know, you're not going to use a hammer when it's something that you need to screw in or, or maybe even dig a hole, things like that. Yeah. I found myself throughout my career, you know, really getting into a system to say, okay, this is what I want it to do. This is how I used to do it with X, Y, and Z platform. And I think you had touched on this a little bit, Alex, about having it be, you know, user friendly and intuitive. We want to say, if we want to pull this report, you know, for me, the way my brain works is if this is how I did it in this other system, how might I do it in this one? Yeah, so. it's, it's, it's hard. Alex, what do you, do you see moving forward that, Salesforce and and um, some of these product lines are are moving towards that, or are they really digging in and, and holding on to their original direction that they took when they were originally designed? Yeah, it's hard for products to change like that over time. Usually, they like Salesforce and these larger um, enterprise organizations. They more like buy smaller companies, integrate that into the system, yeah, as opposed true. to changing their entire way of doing things. Yeah. Uh, and you're right, there is a process, of course, of learning as you change from one system to another. But the fact that you know how reports generally work is probably a concept you can transfer over to your new CRM, for example. Yeah. The details of how that's done might change, just like you were, and I'm dating myself as well, back in the day when I used to use WordPerfect and switch yeah. to Microsoft Word, you know, <laughs> right. you know what you can do with it, exactly. Uh, <laughs> you just need to figure out how to do it in the new system. So there is obviously a change management and a learning process that can be awkward and uncomfortable. But the idea is um, it, it's difficult or I don't see it too often where a, 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 a platform like Salesforce would change the way they do things. Uh, there are reskinnings that it did recently move from classic interface to lightning interface, which made things better overall. Um, but that's more of an interface level thing as opposed to this is the way the, fe the feature changes uh, completely. Yeah. And you mentioned automation and I, I see that happening more and more and coming up because I feel like our workforce, you know, we talk about compassion fatigue, we talk about burnout, we talk about, you know, um, many nonprofits pride themselves on look what we do is so very little, you know, yeah. and so really adding more and more to the plate. So automation, I think the software, the system, whatever it is that we're using really needs to have that automation. And I'm curious, Alex, if you see that automation from teams are actually being used 
to their full effect or if we're just like touching on that surface. You're talking about in terms of the Salesforce context or the overall context? Overall in general, I'm curious what you've seen. I'm not sure there's an end to automation. I think there's something you can always make better, faster, stronger, simpler. Um, the idea is to again, use a level of comfort of comfort that you're, um, use automation to a level you're, that you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. So if it works for sure. you, you're able to do what you're doing. You, you're able to focus on the work that you add value to and you can outsource some of these automation, great. If at some point down the road, you realize maybe there's something more I could automate. Let's see if you can simplify this part of the task and try to automate that part or outsource it, for example. There are different ways of shifting the work so that you don't have to focus on some of these tasks that someone else can do or a system can do just as good as you can. I love that mentality. I think that's just, uh, that's kind of magical thinking uh, because we do have, as Jarrett said, we have, um, so few resources in many, many ways. And then we're trying to, you know, do the work of the angels, heavy loads on our backs. And, and so, yeah, re reasserting how we tackle a problem, a problem or a project. Um, yeah, it's, it's a good way to look at this. Um, Alex Lapa, CEO of Dryad Consulting coming to us from fabulous Southern Spain. Okay. I got to ask, is it past your dinner time now? It is. <laughs> well, we're just getting started here in the West, Western United States. Um, check out Dryad Consulting. It's really an interesting website. You can read about Alex's journey um, as a digital nomad, how he has framed up his work um, in the nonprofit sector. Really quickly, you have an actual app just for the Canadian nonprofit sector. Right. So I noticed a need for Canadian nonprofits using Salesforce, and that's for tax receding. There are not a lot of great choices out there. So I'm actually introducing this as a brand new product uh, available now um, to do that. So tax receding for Canadian nonprofits using Salesforce. Okay. It's called the... yeah, Dryad Receding. Dryad Receding. Dryadreceding.com. Awesome. Well, congratulations. That's, Thank you. That's really amazing. And uh, I've got, you know, the, the nonprofit show is going to be announcing their app very shortly. I'm just, I'm not trying to be competitive, but I am trying to be competitive. That's great. <laughs> um, super cool. Really, really cool. Well, hey, everybody, again, I'm Julia Patrick, been joined by the nonprofit nerd herself, Jared R. Ransom, CEO of the Raven Group. Again, we are so fortunate to have these amazing sponsors who join us day in and day out. They include our friends at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, and the Nonprofit Nerd. They are so important to every episode of the Nonprofit Show. And Jarrett, next week, my friend, I think we kind of start, in the next couple of weeks, I should say, we launch our fourth year of broadcasting. It is coming up and we also will be taking the show on the road um, much more this year than we did last year. So there's a lot happening. It's very exciting. It is. It's very, very exciting. Um, Alex, our dream would be to come and do a live broadcast in Southern Spain. You're more than welcome. <laughs> yeah, we, we might have to make that one happen. Absolutely. <laughs> hey, everybody, as we like to end every episode of the nonprofit show. We want to remind everyone to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow.